South Wales, and he studies insects, stick insects. Uh, Peter? G'day. Well, I know that you all want to be here because um, I didn't make it onto the little booklet, so you must have actually found out and wanted to be here, so I'm really pleased with that. I thought I'd start first with a little bit of a spiel and a little bit of a demo. Um, 2010, I was undergoing chemotherapy for leukemia, and I wanted a project that I could work on for that year where if it turned out to be complete crap, I could just throw away all the commits for a whole year. Uh, so it occurred to me to have a look at a project I last touched in 2007, and I gave a talk in 2007 at LCA about that. Um, and unfortunately, this, that's assumed background for some of this. Uh, I expect a lot of guys are going to be following along on their, on their machines. I know I do with talks. So you can, there'll be links. This is on the website, but it's a little bit challenging to find. Um, SourceForge has been having some issues lately. Or I would have made sure it was all up there and ready for you. So this is a, the compiler I'm talking about is written in C++. It's a cross compiler for a very old dialect of Pascal. Back in the very early 80s, I was playing with Apple Pascal. A number of people were. And I always loathed a number of properties about the compiler, and I always wanted the source so I could fix it. Of course, that was a dire secret, and that sort of thing didn't happen. Um, when I gave the talk in 2007, compiler was proof of concept. I could get very basic functionality to happen, but it really couldn't compile significant programs. In the course of 2010, however, I got the compiler to the point where it could compile the UCSD Pascal operating system sources. It could compile the UCSD, that is cross-compile, cross-compile the UCSD Pascal native compiler and the associated tools that go with that. And uh, there are instructions on the website for how to go about building uh, all of the necessary pieces to make that work. Uh, there's a cross-compiler, there are file system tools, and there's a virtual machine written by a talented bloke called Mario Klebsch, uh, which I repackaged with his permission and put it on SourceForge with a, a matching name. So those are the tools I'm going to be using for this demo. And one of the features of the website is there are pre-compiled disk images. For the last 30 years, people have been using bootleg Apple Pascal disk images um, when they needed to get their retro computer fix. Um, as of about October 2010, I've got um, disk images compiled from source from the 1979 UCSD Pascal original sources. Um, these are available under a moderately permissive non-commercial license. Um, UCSD published the license on their website and they couldn't find any source code. But once the license had been published, lots of people went, oh, here's some. And so now they've got source code to go with the license. They didn't originally, they couldn't find their own source code. Um, <clears throat> but they were assured there was some out there and if they would let people say so, people would say where it was. So this, this demo is small, simple, wrong window. And I've already downloaded the system volume disk image. We're talking, um, Apple Pascal at the time had huge disk images of 140K. Um, they were doing much bigger than uh, other people with five and a quarter drives at that time who only had 120. So, um, so we've got a disk image, I've got a working directory, and the instructions say make a, a file called hello.txt that says hello world. Now with the necessary software installed, and being a good open source enthusiast, these are all available on Launchpad PPA if you're using Ubuntu Linux, and all you have to do is app get install goodness, and it all happens. I'm currently packaging the OS, but A, SourceForge has problems, and, uh, and B, I actually hadn't finished that <coughs> prior to the conference, but it should be possible in the next week or two that you have to say app get install your CSD P system OS and get that too. There's also a reconstructed 
um, user manual available that was taken from scans of the dot matrix manual and OCR'd and hand corrected and stuff. So there's full documentation available as well, which is kind of a surprise. The license for that is slightly less clear, but we're guessing it's the same as for the source code. Um, so let's wrong window. Let's close that one so it doesn't confuse me. So we can. We can compile this, and we get our enormous executable. There's a wrapper which says, turn the current directory into, that one's w dot, turn the current directory into a disk image. Um, and use that system volume as well, so we'll have two disk images mounted. And here we are, welcome to 1979. Um, if anybody ever used Apple Pascal, I realize some of you are much too young. Um, this is very familiar, except for the extra extraneous line which I inserted so people wouldn't be misled into thinking that this really was the original. It is ever so slightly changed to fix a couple of compiler bugs that I found in the original sources. Um, and a couple of OS bugs I found in there too. So uh, this does a bunch of things. It actually um, adapts to the size of the terminal and lies to the Pascal programs as to how big the terminal is to get it right. Used to read it out of a static file, for example, and this manipulates it. So we can execute, sorry, I just have to change directory into the work volume. Now we can execute our hello program and we get, and you get hello world. So our cross compiler um, is capable of making an executable. The fun thing about this is this is reconstructed from sources. So we can also compile this with the original UCSD native compiler, which has been cross-compiled by my cross-compiler. Slightly more involved, slightly more complicated program. And it compiles at some astonishing number of lines per minute. Um, you've got to remember on an Apple Pascal, that would exercise would have taken several seconds. Um, not very slow on a 1 megahertz 6502. And we can execute that. And once again, it says hello world. So that's, that's my live demo of Back to the Future 1979. And to get out of there, you say H for halt. So what I wanted to talk about today was, of course, this compiler. Um, and one tiny aspect of one of the things I learned, I got to the end of this and I got to the point where, fantastic, this thing now actually builds from source. I, I had email conversations with people who worked on it in 1979. I said, now I've got the sources. How did you guys actually build it? Uh, don't know. You know. There's a bunch of files in there for the disassemblers and the assemblers and things, and they're binary formatted opcode tables. Where's the source for the programs that write the, wrote the binary files? Uh, don't know. So there's a whole bunch of stuff which is really interesting. So anyway, and I was thinking, wow, I've actually got it to work. And people said, you know, really well done. And like 68 people have visited the website. <laughs> um, but as a project I could throw away if it was complete rubbish. Uh, it worked very well. So. What else did I learn? I mean, I actually achieved something which I thought was really good when I'm suffering from leukemia and could hardly stand. Um, but I actually learned something that I hadn't expected to learn about C++. So today I'm talking about an aspect, a single small aspect, and I'm using examples of that technique that I applied to the cross-compiler. Now, I acknowledge up front, C++ is a horrible language for doing Compilers in. Pick something else, almost anything else. Um, but it was a language I knew well, I was comfortable using, and I didn't have to wrestle with that aspect of a project I chose to work on. So let's, let's work our way through. Now, this is a really fast revision of the 2007 paper. There's a link there if you want to do a quick abstract syntax tree revision, but I'm sure, judging from most of you, you're not going to need it. So one of the fundamental things about the cross-compiler was that I actually wanted to be able to retarget the grammar. That prompted my 2007 exercise. 
um, I wanted to be able to take the one grammar and instead of hacking the .y file to put different rule bodies in for every different tool, I wanted to be able to share it across cross-compiler and say pretty printer as an example. It turns out I've got a bunch more of them these days. Um, I actually needed some exactly accurate C++ code that would do the linker the same as the original. So since I had a pretty printer, it was a very small exercise to clone that and get it to be out C++ instead of Pascal. Um, also looked a hell of a lot nicer. Um, I, this reminded me why I stopped coding in Pascal in 1979. Uh, really awful. So. Um, the fundamental um, revelation in this was to use an abstract base pointer. And all of the syntax rules go through the abstract base pointer. Um, it means that I can retarget the grammar and leave the yak grammar entirely alone and simply derive another class. Uh, fundamentally, it, it maps onto the grammar itself, so you get abstract syntax trees as a consequence. And there's an abstract translator that's the context pointer. There's an abstract statement, there's an abstract expression, and there's refinements all the way down. Um, so the neat thing is that it's virtual, and we wind up with, well, actually, a really big abstract base class with about 140 factory methods. So now, and we can churn out interesting object. So that's, that's the revision. I followed the link if you, if you need it slightly slower. So, first revelation is what you're looking at is how C compilers used to be written when I started working on C compilers in the early 80s. And they typically would have a C struct with a type specifier and then a union which was indexed, accessed according to the type of thing it is. Now, really horrible C++. How do you write that in C++? The first thing to realize is this is a type-based dispatch. Frequently, that discriminator um, member in the struct was called type, or a synonym of type. So C++ has a much better type system than C, which is, you know, <laughs> 100 times better than 0 is still 0, right? So. <clears throat> um, so what do we do? How do we, how do we goose this code so that instead of me doing type-based dispatch manually, I can get the language to do the type-based dispatch for me, to maintain the type-based dispatching me machinery for me and save me some effort? And this is why I wrote it in C++ and not in C. Um, so our example here is of an, an expression, uh, and we're going to which class, do, which method do I choose? Code generation, okay. Um, near as possible, I have used the actual opcodes that the cross-compiler uses, but you'll find that some of the classes and some of the other machinery has been vastly simplified. Um, this code, all this example code uses simple actual pointers. The, um, the implementation uses smart pointers, which are neither smart nor pointers. <coughs> um, but the point to be made with this slide is that the actual guts, the actual piece that does the work, is the same. It's only the machinery has been done automatically for me by the compiler. Now, if anybody, anybody knows any of the ways that virtual methods are implemented, you will realize that this is no slower than the original C code, and there is a chance it is faster. But it won't be any slower. I'm going to come up with some other examples later. So the challenge here, therefore, is I have a convention in my code that one class, one source file, which means that, of course, suddenly I have an explosion of source files where we didn't have it before. So um, e tags and all the rest of it is your friend because you've got to be able to navigate the, navigate the sources. So. The next, the next problem comes along in that, okay, there are some other things I want to do. And when I put the grammar together, Pascal was designed to be um, um, LR1 parsable. And then people went and added size of, and it stopped being an 
L01 grammar. Uh, because you now have an, an ambiguity, and the only one, on identifier when you say size of identifier. Is it a type or is it a variable? Up until that point, Pascal was an LL, sorry, not even an LR1, it was an LL1 grammar. Easily parsed with a recursive descent parser that you could understand. Why on earth would you need YAC? But it got more complicated. Um, the second thing they did was it would frequently say syntax error at me when I wrote perfectly sensible code until dredged out of the back of my consciousness was the fact that assignment in Pascal is written colon equals, but I've been coding in C and C++ for so long, getting that colon to come out of my fingers was very hard. So the compiler would keep going, syntax error, syntax error. And what I really wanted was it for it to say, doofus, I bet you meant colon equals there. Uh, I needed it because I was really suffering. The reason we're saying syntax error was, of course, a statement required a left-hand side and a colon equals and a right-hand side in the grammar. And, of course, an equal sign can't appear in a left-hand side expression. So, syntax error. Bad person. So, I rearranged the grammar into much more C-like grammar, and it would say expression, and then it would look at it to see whether it returned anything other than void and bitch at you. Um, and unlike the C semantics where an assignment returns the value, I made an assignment return a void so that all of the other type checking wouldn't bitch further down the line. And then I was in a position to say, well, I'm looking at a single expression and it's an equality test instead of an assignment, so probably you made a mistake, doofus. Fix it. So now I got sensible error messages again. But this changed the game, because how do you know if an expression's on the left or the right? You don't. You don't write until you see that assignment operator. And does it matter? Statistically, most of the time, you're going to be on the right-hand side, or effectively the right-hand side. You want the value, not the address. So an arbitrary expression, seeing an identifier in the grammar, says, wacko, it must be a variable, access the variable. And when, that, uh, when it's discovered it's actually on the left-hand side, we now have to grope it, pull the address out of it, and turn it into the appropriate assignment operator. Assignment abstract expression tree node. Or not quite so abstract anymore, very definite one. But of course, in any program language, whether it is a virtual machine for UCSD Pascal, or actually native compiled C code, different variables are accessed different ways. Variables on the stack are accessed as a local variable. Global variables, of course, are accessed by address. They're not stack relative. They're not indexed off the stack point or anything else. And then you've got uh, external variables that have to be linked later. Um, Apple, Apple Pascal. UCSD Pascal actually has external variables that get linked later. It's got all of those facilities, and they're all working in the cross-compiler, yay. So, we have to rearrange our expression tree, and we, we can do this in a moderately kind of sort of really fugly type safe way, in that we can find out if we've cocked up. With really slow, nasty downcasts in C++, at least the compiler will tell you if you've really, really screwed the pooch. These are slow, and get address. I mean, that getter exists solely to grope its privates so that we can build another expression. So re aesthetically, it reeks twice, not just once. So it's slow, and it's groping privates, and we've got getters that would be really nice to do without. And if all of those things fail, then we have an error. Dumb thing to do. So it turns out that is, let's go back one. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. It turns out that is another example of a type-based dispatch. Test the type, depending on the type, do something else. Test the type, depending on the type, do something else. But instead of a switch, we're doing it longhand, and we're trolling through this stuff. Yuck. 
So how do we rearrange this code to use the type-based mechanisms that C++ already provides to do type-based dispatch? Virtual method again. So here we go. We wind up with the same mapping I did before. Turn to a virtual method. The amount of code's the same. The lines of code that do the real work, there's just the same number of them. But this definitely goes faster. I'm not doing any downcasts with their nasty tests. I'm going straight to it. The trick is, where do I put it? In what class do I put make me an assignment expression? I actually put it in the expression itself. The expression, the, the very thing that I need to grope, instead of groping it, ask it to do it. So, the piece that goes in our grammar now says right hand, left hand side. I know you think you're right hand side, but please turn yourself into a left hand side and here's your right hand side. Make an assignment, please. And that's what we've done. The expression object now has a factory method of its own, saying, please manufacture a new assignment abstract tree node that's appropriate. The second thing to note is no more groping privates. Don't need it anymore. That get is gone. Because it's private and it stays private, which is nice. And the last of all thing is that, where do we put the error message? Oh shit, where do we put it? It's easy. <laughs> Default implementation in the expression class for addition opcodes, for, for function call opcodes, for multiplication opcodes, they all go, what a dumb thing to put on the left hand side of an, an assignment. Boom, error message. So, there we go. Comes out nice and clean, and it goes faster. No more downcasts. Bang, one indirection, whoop, straight into the appropriate method. Not that we've got a real speed competition happening here. The original compiler compiled at a few lines a minute. This is, this is doing all those compilations. It's sub one second for the largest compiles that I can find. The compiler itself, the native UCSD compiler, compiles in less than a second. We're screaming along compared to our one megahertz um, competition. But that's not the point. Aesthetically, this is way higher on the aesthetic meter. Um, downside, because I keep insisting on one, one file per class because I think it's cleaner, um, things get interesting. One of the pieces, one of the techniques I've been using for many years, and it actually makes it much easier to navigate, is I make the class hierarchy and the direct directory hierarchy map onto each other. So now you can look at a class name expression LDO and know that it's going to be called expression slash LDO with some .cc or .h with some decorators depending on whether it's in the library or one of the tools. So now we have a factory factory. We've got a factory manufactures an expression that in turn later manufactures another expression. So we have a factory factory. Yay! Uh, the interesting, fun part of this, occasionally, even me who wrote most of this stuff, you look at a code fragment, and it's like, how did I get here? How did I get here? What makes it go? And how does somebody coming to the sources cold figure out what the heck is going on? Okay, I'm going to write another expression tree, and I know that I have to do the code generate method, and I glue that in, and I don't have to write anything else except the code generate method. Yay! Even the um, pretty printer, by the way, has a code generate method, but it generates text. Same deal. So, dum dum dum, and we've got our global store op code. Um, it turned out in the end, instead of calling it store global to actually call it after the opcode made mapping source code onto what the heck was going on was much easier. So the naming convention that you'll see in the source code is that the expression trees, when they're no longer abstract, when they're quite definite, they have the opcode name. I don't have the second level indirection that GCC has. But how did I get here? But if I'm adding a new expression tree node, do I care? The piece I want to debug is this piece of code. I don't want to debug the other machinery. The machinery's already been debugged. 
for all the other opcodes that I already did. Just this one I want to work, so do I care? Well, yes and no. I've got a slide later on which enumerates all the levels, but the levels are there, and the levels are there in the grammar, and the grammar points you where you want to go, because you've got that left-hand side pointing at right-hand side factory, please, sitting there in the grammar. The grammar tells you, the levels in the grammar tell you where you're going to be. But, yes, there are times when even I look at the code and think, how did I get here? I've got to debug it. But how do we get there? How do we write our test case? This thing comes with 570-something test cases. Um, test cases turn out to be easy to write because you just write Pascal. You know, A colon equals 1. It's not, it's, you just write the test case. The grammar's already been debugged. The expression junk has already been debugged. I'm just testing global opcode store instead of local opcode store. That's the only thing I'm interested in testing. So you can get there. But your second problem is, hang on, that explodes. I mean, if I've got factories making factories, don't I now have this enormous cross product of space to test? Well, yeah, it's a language. The problem space already had the cross product in it. It's just that the code is the same shape now. So, yeah, you do get an explosion. Is it unnatural? No. In fact, I think it maps onto the code very well. Does it make more testing required rather than less? Well, no. I could have written it the old-fashioned manual way, doing the exact explicit thing, because I had the same amount of code doing the same job. But the type-based dispatch part is being done by the language for me instead of me maintaining it manually. So, we don't have any more code, we don't have any more test cases, and we actually don't have it terribly much harder to navigate, except that I exploded it out one per file instead of one switch case per. So, yeah, there's a few more files to navigate. E-tags is your friend. So, yes, I, I don't think this makes the problem worse. It might not make it better, but I don't think it makes the problem worse. So. Oh, I should have remembered I had this slide. So this demonstrates our leftness versus our rightness. Um, and we generate a test case, x equals 1, to, in order to get our, our appropriate piece, and it all reaches the methods we're after. So, okay. So I did this talk had more factories in it. Another place in the code that I needed to explore. You've just seen an identifier in your grammar. Well, what is it? Is it type? Is it a local variable? Is it a global variable? Is it an external variable? There's actually a bunch of other things it could be. So we take this, and our grammar says, just build me a name expression, because I might be a pretty printer, it might be a compiler, whatever. And inside of our compiler, We've got our name expression factory. Now, we can do that, we can implement that name expression factory two ways. We can laboriously grope it for each sort, same as we did last time for assignments. Only this would be for local variables. And it has the same, it can be dealt with the same way, taking this explicit type-based dispatch, turning the handle, turning it into, let the compiler do it for me. I'd, I'd rather it did it. Um, and again, it's faster. Does it make any, it, does it add additional complexity? No. The bits that do the work are the same. And that's the point. We're not doing any extra work, we're getting there faster, we're not adding test cases, we're not adding test complexity. It's the nature of the problem that contains the complexity, but the way we're using the tool now reflects that. But now it gets really complicated, because how did I get here? I've got a factory, factory, factory. Not only did I have to figure out what sort of variable I was and leap into the thing, and then that variable, what is the variable? There? How did that work again? Where was the natural place to put that dispatch? Well, this time we said to the symbol. 
Symbol, make me a right-hand side expression node. That's our next factory. It's manufacturing the appropriate instance. Might be a pretty printer node. It might be a pretty printer symbol. It might be a compiler symbol. It might be a one of the back ends that I want to write as a doxygen documenting thing because this compiler is big and it's written in 1979 and it's disgusting. Horrible. I'm based off the, the P4 compiler by Ullman who didn't even speak English. Well, he did, but not very well. So, yeah, it's been through a few iterations. So, yeah, we've got our factory, factory, factory. So, the problem is, we got here. Now, we haven't actually changed anything. We haven't changed the complexity. We haven't changed the problem. Blah, 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 blah. It's the same deal. How did I get here? If that's not the piece you're trying to debug, that's not the bit you need to worry about. This is the bit, if that's the opcode you're adding, that's the bit you need to worry about. And again, we have this. Now, I promised you that we'd get a list of, this is the sequence of how I got there. And it reflects the grammar quite well. The different layers when you break out the abstract syntax tree. So we have a bunch of methods that call, get called in sequence and it arrives there. And it's actually really short. It's not very deep which is nice. I figure I can get my head around this because it's not very deep and it's not very many lines of code. So I actually like this better. After I would got my head around the cross product of how big the problem space was, oh, hang on, it's a programming language, of course it's got a big cross product. It's meant to have an infinite cross product. To comparing the code that I started with, huge switches, multi, multi, multi num numbers of pages, into much smaller pieces that I could get my head around even though my brain had been largely switched off by the chemotherapy drugs. But did you ever wonder where those symbols came from? Same trick, same technique. What scope is it? Oh, here you go. There's a variable name. There's its type. Declare it. Hello, scope. Declare one. So now we have a Bonus factory in the title just for you. A factory, 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 factory. Um, they used kind of all over. And, uh, and we still get the same ugly object out at the other end. So this is the piece that I realized that there is numerous places in my code, even though I've been writing C++ for longer than I think I should probably admit, um, I was still writing type based dispatch manually when I thought I was writing good C++ code. And it turns out that there was something to learn, even this many years later, about exploiting language better, and I think coming up with actually clearer code. So if you should happen to take a wander in the code, there's a bit more abstraction going on to uh, maintain less code rather than more. Uh, if you look at the code, one of the things that I've tried very hard to do is to eliminate um, copy and paste because that's a design error, largely. And so I've tried to use derived classes very smartly to avoid any possibility of copy and paste where possible. So that's, that was my insight after eight months of chemotherapy. Type-based dispatch. You can still do it better. So. Up the back, right, I see these recalcitrants of learn. <laughs> right. Just wondering if we can throw in a fifth level to dispatch whether we, the output, whether it goes to pretty print or code. Um, there might be one or two more places that it's actually done, so. Um, particularly, one of my gripes with the old compiler was that it didn't optimize very well, in fact, optimized almost not, not at all. I've got infinite amount of memory compared to a 48K Apple II. So it won't surprise you that the optimize method is a factory. Anyone else?
is is the optimization something that can be portable enough to fit into the same factory architecture? Um, can you optimize for different architectures in the same way? Uh, well, I, you could use the technique. I don't believe it's going to cross CPUs very well. Um, but you can certainly optimize that way. You can write yourself an optimizer that would do that. One of the things that I have been thinking of writing, but given that 68 people have actually bothered to visit the source code, the web page, and fewer than that have downloaded it, I don't think it's a good use of my time. But one of the things that has been suggested is to read in old 1979 P code, optimize it, and write out brain spanking new, much faster, much smaller P code. Uh, but no, I don't think it's going to cross. But the, the optimization by itself, one of the other pieces that is used in all of this is I've tried very hard to have everything be right once. I'm trying to do a bunch of functional techniques, and particularly single assignment, so that the optimized method, for example, does not operate in place. It manufactures a new expression instance. Um, it will recycle as much as it can of down further below, of course, but it manufactures a new expression instance. And that's how we can, that's how in the example of a store global, it doesn't come out that way. Initially it is, you know, address of variable indirect assignment tree, and those indirections, the address of and the indirect get folded because we didn't do an array calculation, and they all get smooshed together into a, an immediate um, store opcode. But, um, yeah, and that's done as an optimization because you don't know at the time what you need to do. So, certainly the technique works. I don't know that it crosses CPUs terribly well. This is a virtual machine that I'm compiling to. I'm not compiling the 6502 assembler. Um, and interestingly, if you read up on some of the history of Java, it was this virtual machine that inspired some of Java's features, uh, which is probably why some of it's so bloody ugly, <laughs> actually. Um, these guys were writing at a time when, Make was, when Unix was already working. And Feldman wrote Make in 1977, and this is 1979 era code. So there was already an example of how to use a PDP-11 much better than what these guys were doing with their PDP-11 in 1979. But they didn't realize that. It's interesting, isn't it? The, uh, the uh, LCA is coming to an end and you guys are starting to slow down. Where's the fiery questions? What happened to yesterday? <laughs> oh, look, we've got a game one. Here we go. It's just entrenchment and inception. We have to go deeper. Design patterns. What do you think about design patterns and how do they, um, how do they map to the use of multiple, multiple levels of factory in your design? Uh, the, the multiple levels is a reflection of the nature of the problem. It is not a reflection of the nature of the pattern. Um, the factory pattern is there. The factory pattern makes a great deal of sense. Letting the language do it rather than doing it manually makes even more sense. It's got a better chance of optimizing it than you have manually as your situation changes. Um, initially, a good author will be able to write better than the compiler for a medium mature compiler. But as compilers mature, no, your ability to outguess it is probably less. As the problem space changes, as the available developers change, the chances of them doing better than the compiler are slim. So much prefer letting the compiler do this than me doing it manually and having to maintain that machinery manually. If you've ever done this in C, of course, you've got address of function pointers all over the place and indirection, and then life gets grim. Um, or you're writing something like the kernel where it's absolutely essential. Um, but yeah, I. I I'm, I use design patterns a lot. Some of it has been an exercise of, oh, look, I've been using that pattern for all those years, but that wasn't what I called it. Um, for, for people who are experienced coders, they're frequently using design patterns and not knowing. Design patterns are very real, and I think going out and discovering more only gives you more tools in your toolbox. So you go and read the books, and you read the papers, and you, you hang on to the ideas, because one day it's going to be, oh, I know how to do that. Huge 
done a great job, mate. <laughs> <laughs> Please take this in appreciation from LCA. Thank you. Um, it's been a very interesting talk, most of it way over my head, but that was still bloody great there. Chaps, put your hands together for him, please. <laughs> One of the things uh, you probably don't know about, unless you've been keeping up to date, the next talk in here, uh, there is one now, it's how to lie like a geek. <laughs> <laughs>